What's the difference between brewing extract with steeping grains and partial mashing? What grains can be steeped and which ones should be mashed? What the f even is mashing? Well, come along as I brew two versions of the Brave Noise Pale Ale recipe. I dig into mashing and look at some potential benefits of partial mashing. Well, let's get brewing. Well, welcome. My name is Brent. I got a lot to cover, so let's get into it. As I mentioned in my first video on the Brave Noise Pale Ale, their extract recipe called for using flaked oats in a partial mash. I was a little curious about that, so I wanted to dig a little bit into what is the real difference between steeping grains and partial mashing. So that inspired me to do my first partial mash beer ever. That's the one we talked about in the last video. Well, let's first look closer at the original Brave Noise Pale Ale, and then look at the changes that I made for the two batches. Remember, the original recipe was for a five gallon batch, I split that in half to do two, two and a half gallon batches. So the original recipe, if we scaled it in half, was calling for two pounds of extra light dry malt extract, eight ounces of wheat dry malt extract. And then they also had what they labeled a partial mash, which include eight ounces of flaked oats and also seven ounces of a caramel 20. As we get into it, I wouldn't really classify that as a partial mash. So based on that recipe, I created two versions. One of them was the steeped one. That one included the same two pounds of Pills and Light DME, but instead of using the wheat dry malt extract, they used flaked wheat. So I used eight ounces of flaked wheat, and then eight ounces of flaked oats, and seven ounces of a Crystal 15. The Crystal 15 was just what I had on hand. The second one was a partial mash. That one used the same two pounds of Pills and Light DME, and then I used eight ounces of malted wheat, eight ounces of flaked oats, and seven ounces of the same Crystal 15. Wait, I thought I said I did two versions. Didn't I just show the same recipe twice? Well, did you notice the difference? So the partial mash version had malted meat, where the steep one just had flaked wheat. So if you're wondering why I would have gone through all the effort to make two batches of beer with such a small change, just malted wheat versus flaked wheat, well, let's get into the difference between mashing and steeping. So steeping and mashing, or partial mashing, is something that I see a lot of new brewers confuse, and I understand why. I see a lot of books and a lot of recipes that confuse the do. They do things, then label them as a partial mash, and I think they're just steeping, or they follow the steps that are needed for a partial mash, but they're just using steeping grains. There's a lot of information on the web about the difference in the two, but I'll put a couple links to some articles that I found that were really helpful. The first one is from a site called Homebrew Answers. It provides a good high-level view of the differences. The second one is from a BYO Magazine article. I think it did a great job. Let's look at a couple of the quotes from that. So the question, what exactly is the difference between mashing and steeping? Don't both procedures basically involve soaking grain in hot water? Great question. So the answer to that one says that mashing is a technique in which malted grains are soaked and amylase enzymes from the grains convert their starch to fermentable sugars. Don't worry too much about terms like amylase. It goes on to say, the key to mashing is that starch is broken down into fermentable sugars. And as far as steeping, the article says, steeping on the other hand, is a method used to extract colors and flavors from certain types of specialty grains. Steeping merely extracts compounds contained in the malt. So my key from that is that enzymes, which come from malted grains, convert starches into fermentable sugars. So if we separate that sentence in two, it means you need both enzymes and you also need starches that can be converted into sugars. So there's lots of different ways you can break up grains out there and try to put them into buckets. So we'll take those two. Does the grain contain enzymes? Yes or no. Does the grain contain starches, which can then be converted into sugars and fermented? So the first group we'll look at are the ones that contain both enzymes and convertible starches. These are your light colored malted grains. So malting is actually pretty important here. Malting is a process where a grain is partially germinated and stopped, and that builds up the enzymes in the grain. If you don't malt the grain, you don't have the enzymes needed for conversion. This group of grains really needs to be mashed. They provide the enzymes conversion, both either their own starches, and if they have enough diastatic power or enough enzymes, they'll also be able to convert the starches in other grains. Examples of these are your standard base grains, your Pilsner, your Two-Row, your Pale Ale malts. Also some character base grains like Vienna and Munich. Something else people don't think about as base grains are your other malted grains. Your malted wheat, your malted oats, your malted rye. Hey, we used malted wheat in that recipe, didn't we? Since I mentioned diastatic power, I throw a quick note on it. 
Here, at least here in the US, it's measured in degrees Lintner. Around 30 degrees is needed for a grain to self-convert. If it has a higher level, it can also convert other sugars. North American barley is typically very high in diastatic power, often in the 120, 150 range. So continental European, English, and some craft malts can add be pretty low. They vary quite a bit, but they can be down in the 30, 40 range. Vienna and Munich are also one that can vary quite a bit and often can be on that low end of the range where they have enough power to convert themselves, but they don't have enough to convert other grains in the mash. So if you have questions about the specific malt you're using, check with the maltster. They'll usually provide the information. This next group, and this will be a quick one, these are ones that have the enzymes needed for conversion, but they don't have any starches left. So this group, is actually nothing in it. The grains that have enzymes remain are just your low-colored base malts. Any of the processes that are going to convert the starches into either crystals or sugar or roast them will also denature the enzymes. That's why there's none that fit into this category. That's nice. Let's move on to the next one. These are ones that don't have enzymes, but they do have a lot of unconverted starches. Again, as I mentioned, it's the malting process that activates the enzymes that are needed for mashing. So if you're using any kind of light-colored, unmalted, or raw grains, such as raw wheat, oats, etc. A lot of adjunct grains, say corn and rice, flake grains too. So your flaked wheat, your flaked oat, your flaked barley, your flaked rye. So all of those are unmalted. So they don't provide the enzymes needed conversion, but they do bring a lot of starches to the table. So this group really needs to go in the mash, at least in theory. So the next group has no enzymes and also has no starches. These ones may be malted or they may be unmalted, there's really two big groups here. So one group is your crystalline caramel malts, which are very similar malts. During the malting process, they go through a step where basically the starches in the grain are converted into sugars, and then they go through a crystallization caramelization process for those sugars. That's where the name comes from. These ones contribute colors, flavors, and also come sweetness. The next big group of grains in here are your roasted ones, and these can be malted or unmalted. Essentially, the starches inside the grain are roasted. These contribute dark colors, dark flavors, coffee, roast chocolate type flavors. So both of these, both your crystal and your roasted ones, are great ones to be steeped, because all you're doing here is extracting those colors and the flavors. In the case of crystal malt, some of those sweetness. So if we stop right there, it'd be pretty clear. We've got three fairly distinct groups of grains. One, we've got our malted base grains, and these are the ones that really need to be mashed, and they can go in the mash up to 100%, your Viennas, your two rows, your pale malts. Next, we've got our unmalted grains. These ones really need to be mashed with base grains. These are your flaked oats, your flaked wheat, your corn, your rice. The next group, or it could be two groups, is crystal malts and roasted grains. These ones can be steeped, or they can be added to the mash. This next group of grains can be a little confusing. These ones, they don't have enzymes. They do have starches, so we already kind of covered that group. So the difference between these ones, unlike say your flaked oats, is that they provide a lot of color and flavor. So these ones in general are all your sort of medium killed malts. They fall below about 150 degrees Levabon. That's not a hard cutoff, but if you're looking at any killed grains that are above about 20 Levabon, and below about 150 Levabon, they probably fit into this category. These are ones that really technically should be mashed, but they are often seen in a recipe just in a steeping mode. So if they are steep, they do provide some colors and some flavors, but they're also contributing unconverted starches. So how big of a problem is that? I'm not quite sure. I read different opinions on it. Some people say those unconvertible starches in there, they lead to problems with your beer, with haze and stability and long-term storage, but I'm not quite sure. So what malts are we talking about here? Examples of ones fit in here are say your biscuit, your victory, aromatic, melanoidin, your honey malts, stuff like that that adds some kind of that toasty, bready flavors. Some brown malt, which adds some nice chocolatey kind of flavors, coffee flavors to a beer. Special roast, different like toasted oats, toasted rye. So no, this is a kind of an ever-growing category of malts. I see a lot of new malts introduced in this area. Often they use kind of marketing term names labeled to them. And sometimes the information from the maltster really isn't very clear of what the process is used to make the malts. So I also want to point out, when I was doing research into mashing and steeping, I came across a lot of conflicting information on exactly what malts can be steeped or should be steeped. Dextrin malts, like the carapils, carafoam. I've read some that say they should be mashed. I've read some that say they're actually better if you steep them. Stuff like golden naked oats or other 
non-barley crystal malts. Can those be treated just like crystal malts? I hear conflicting information on those. Some of the medium colored roasted malts, say like the Brees Extra Special Roast that are in that darker range. And also some like acidulated malt, smoked malt, chip malt. I'm sure all those grains have a lot of starches in them. They probably should be mashed. Whether they have enzymes or not, I'm not quite sure. So if we cycle back, I came up with four big categories of malts. Well, five if you separate out crystal and roasted malts. So one, we have our malted base grains, which can make up 100% of the mash, and they provide enzymes and starch for your beer. Two, we've got our unmalted grains. These ones really should be mashed, along with some base grains that provide enzymes for conversion. Three, we've got our crystal and roasted malts. These ones can be steeped or added to the mash. So these ones are great ones for an extract with steeping. And then we've got our medium kiln malts. These ones you really should mash, although people do steep them occasionally. And then to add a little bit more confusion to the rest, I do see recipes that call for steeping Vienna or Munich, which are base malts. And I often see recipes that talk about steeping flake grains, like flaked oats. Hey, kind of like the partial mash in the Brave Noise recipe, huh? So as we cycle back to the Brave Noise recipe, maybe it'd be a little bit more clear this time. So remember, the original grain called for a partial mash of flaked oats and caramel. The flaked oats is an unmalted grain, has no enzymes, but does have starches. The caramel malt has no enzymes and no starches. So in this case, there's nothing that's providing enzymes, so no conversion is going to happen. So I'm saying this one is not a mash. This one is just steeping. So the first recipe I talked about had flaked oats, which is an unmalted grain with no enzymes, but does have starches. This one was flaked wheat, also an unmalted grain with no enzymes, but does have starches. And then we had caramel malt or crystal malt. That one has no enzymes, but it does have starches. So you see, once again, there's no grains, no malt in here that are providing enzymes. No conversion is gonna happen. So I'm saying this one is not a mash. This one is steeping. So the other recipe I talked about had the same flaked oats, which again, unmalted grain with no enzymes and starches, but this time we had malted wheat and malted wheat is a malted grain. It has enzymes that can help convert the starches that are in that grain, but also has enough diastatic power to convert the other starches in the other grains in the recipe. We also have the caramel malt, which doesn't have enzymes, it doesn't have starches. So I'm calling this one a partial mash because it has the requirements. It's got enzymes and it's also got convertible starches. So if we cycle back to the original requirement for a mash, both you need to have enzymes and you need to have convertible starches. So if the only grains you're using in your extract beer are crystal malts and roasted malts, none of those have convertible starches, so you don't need a mash, so you can just steep those in warm water to extract the colors and flavors of those grains. On the other hand, if your extract beer has specialty grains, such as brown malts or victory malts or Munich malts, you're going to want to do a mash, and that'll convert those starches into sugars. So instead of having a bunch of starches in your beer, you'll have some more fermentable sugars. So I know about the terms mashing versus partial mashing. So partial mash is really just referring to a recipe where the majority of the fermentable sugars are come, come from malt extracts. Often it could be 80% of the fermentals are from malt extract. It could be as much as 50-50% split. If the percentage of the extract starts to shrink, at some point you just get into where you're doing an all grain batch and you're adding a little bit of extract in there. So we talked a lot about mashing and partial mashing. So why would you want to even do a partial mash? Well, I see two big advantages for extract brewers. One, it opens up your options for a lot of grains. So extract is produced by only a few major maltsters and there's only a handful available. Usually like a Pills, a Golden, maybe a Pale Ale malt. Then there's also usually ink amber, dark, some different colored malts. Sometimes there's a, maybe a Munich or maybe a Maris Otter, if you can find those. So you're basically limited to steeping crystal malts and steeping roasted malts. So you really can make a lot of beer with just those extract, roasted grains, and crystal malts, especially when you think about hops, yeast, spices, different sugars and flavorings that you can add to a beer. So partial mash really does open you up to a lot of other grains though. Say for doing flaked oats, for doing an oatmeal stout, or doing a New England IPA. The flavorful malts, say the special roast, the aromatic, the brown malt, stuff like that that you want to use in your beer. Also, character from base malts, the Vienna, the Munichs, the Maris Otters, something you often can't find in extracts. The other big reason I see is that compared to all grain, partial mashing has a lot less equipment requirements. Basically, if you're already brewing extract, there's really no additional equipment needed 
You'll see in the video I use a small little beverage cooler. That's not even really needed. Just need a pot that you can insulate or maybe just keep it warm in your oven. I don't think precise mash tempers are really all that critical, especially with a partial mash. There's a pretty wide range where enzymes are active. You just need to keep it in that active range for 30 minutes to an hour and you'll be fine. All right, so I've done a lot of talking. I think it's time to drink some beer. Like I said, I brewed two batches of the Brave Noise Pale Ale. One I call a steep, one I call a partial mash. It's always nice when I talk a little bit of theory and then I have some beers that demonstrate that theory. And hopefully those beers will show that some of the theories about partial mashing and what you can mash and can steep are correct. No spoilers, you're gonna have to stick around to see if they do. Well, it looks like you might have to stick around a little while longer to get to that tasting in the brew day video. I'm a little over the 15 minute mark. I think I've got a lot of great content here. So I put a lot of time and effort both into the planning and the creation of this video. So I sure hope it comes across as useful as I think it's gonna be. So I've got a lot of great content that's in the work. I have a Philly sour with rose hip that was turned out quite nice. I have a saison that I made with Lalamon Farmhouse. I've also got this New England IPA that I just recently kegged and turned out really nice. So if you're interested in that type of content and you want to find your way back to the second half of this video, make sure you hit that subscribe button. Cheers!